Hi, and welcome to Smelling Coffee, a ministry of First Baptist Church in Cleveland, Mississippi. I'm so glad you joined us today, and we have a very special guest with us, Thank Brother you. Bob Self, and uh, I'm so glad that he has uh, graciously agreed to be on the show for two episodes. So if this is your first time with us, or if you just watch occasionally, you'll want to go on and make plans to be here next week, because we're going to air the, the second part of this interview next week. So thank you for being with us, Brother Bob. My pleasure. Thank you. I, uh, Brother Bob was my preacher when I was a little girl at First Baptist Church in Batesville. He was the first preacher that I ever um, really remembered listening to and the one that uh, was the one I went to when I received Jesus as my Savior, the one that baptized me. Uh, he tried twice. One time <clears throat> uh, I was supposed to be baptized and I realized I was going to go underwater. And so uh, he was standing there doing this. And I realized that and I was afraid of water at the time. <laughs> so I shook my head and said no. no. And so it took me three years of swimming lessons to be able to be baptized. That was so funny. <laughs> I loved it. But finally, he baptized me. And um, as we always introduce an episode with a coffee cup, I pulled this out of our church kitchen because when I think of Brother Bob. This is one of our church kitchen uh, china pieces. And I think of church. This is what I associate with Brother Bob. But he's got such a wonderful story that's beyond church and, and God's faithfulness beyond church. So I want to read uh, Lamentations 3, some of my favorite verses, and then I'm going to just let Brother Bob share with us about God's faithfulness and uh, what God has done in his life. These are my favorite verses. This is from the Amplified Version. It's uh, Lamentations 3, 21 through um, 25. But this I recall, and therefore I have hope and expectation. It is because of the Lord's mercy and loving kindness that we are not consumed, because his tender compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great and abundant is your stability and faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, my share, says my living being. Therefore will I hope in him and wait expectantly for him. The Lord is good to those who wait hopefully for and expectantly for Him. And so, Brother Bob, I want you to just tell us about your life of, uh, with the Lord and His faithfulness. Um, he did this a, a one Sunday quite a while ago. Yes. And I happened to miss it. And all over town, I heard about this testimony I missed. And so that's why I want him to come and share today. Okay. Well, thank you, Jennifer. It is uh, really a joy for me to be here with you. And to share some of the things that God has done in my life. Um, it's been a joy to be at First Baptist Church Cleveland for a good part of the year, and uh, I have really enjoyed that after I just recently retired from a church down in Grenada. Um, being here has been a real joy, a real privilege, and um, looking back uh, on my life, I was I was actually born on a plantation not so many miles from Cleveland, probably 20 miles or something. And recently I had an interesting thing that happened to me. I, I had never been to the place where I was born. And for some reason I was preaching here in Cleveland at the time and it just all of a sudden I had this overwhelming desire on a Sunday afternoon that I wanted I wanted to find out and see where I was born. I wanted, to, I wanted to have the privilege of standing on a piece of ground and that causing me to remember that this is where my 17-year-old mother birthed me. Mm -hmm. I'd never known that. And for some reason it just kind of got to eating inside me. And so I went up to the general area where I had been told that I had been born. And um, when I did that, I got up there, it was kind of drizzling rain, and there was a, an older gentleman uh, who might have lived on that farm, I don't know. Uh, well, I know he lived on it at one time, and so I, I saw this fellow out there, and I pulled up to him and just said, uh, told him who I was, which he, obviously, that didn't make any difference. He didn't know me, and I didn't know him. But I told him that I had been born on this property, so I had been told. And he said I was too. He was my age or older. And uh, we got to talking about it. I was mainly just listening and he talked about it. And finally I said, I would just like to know where I was born. 
And uh, he said, uh, well, you know, I don't rightly know. But if I had to guess, I figure it would be over that away somewhere. So I've closed it down to that. I've got it narrowed down to that, over that away somewhere <laughs> I was born. I've kind of, uh, I won't say that I've given up on that. My mother and daddy were sharecroppers on a farm, as so many people were uh, back in those days, um, so many years ago. And uh, my mother was 17 years old and three months when I was born. A story that I've always been told is, as she told me, that she picked cotton the day I was born. And so I never really thought about any of that, and, and I guess I didn't even care about it until I came over here to be with these wonderful people in mm -hmm. Cleveland for a little while. And once I was with them, and in my mind, I have a grandfather that's buried in Marigold, and uh, my mother's uh, father. And then at that time, just, uh, just becoming friends with so many people who are associated with this wonderful church and this city, and with uh, the university and all of that, I got interested in it. But nothing good was to come out of it, actually, except that I got some peace. And, and um, you know, my mother, uh, my mother and my father had a hard time, like, like everybody did, I guess, at the time. And uh, as I thought about all that they, what it must have been like uh, as kids, to bring a child into the world and you live in some kind of a shack and you pick a little cotton and that's about all your life is. You have no hopes, uh, you have no background, you grew up in such poverty you had no studies. And uh, I, I've, I've found out as much as I could about my mother and my father's situation. And uh, it was kind of a heartbreaking thing. But let me tell you a neat thing that God did out of that. Um, I already knew this. I mean, I've, I have been a pastor for 52 years. Um, in, in, the, in the context of this, uh, I was lying on my bed at home. I went home from having been over there on that particular day trying to find something out. And then I drove on home and, and uh, I, I have to confess to you that I was a little bit upset and uh, as I drove home, when, once I got home, uh, I just laid down on my bed and uh, football was just getting started, uh, professional football. So I laid down, some game came on. I really wasn't interested, but in the context of watching that game and having had the kind of day that I had had, I remembered God just spoke to my heart. And as much as I would like to know the exact spot, the exact 20 square feet of where I came into this world, I would like to know that. Um, I guess I shall never. But God spoke to my heart a wonderful message, and it was simply, Bob, it's a lot more important where you end up mm. than where you came from. Uh, I came pretty much from nowhere. My family uh, pretty much came from nowhere. Uh, but you know, if I'd had everything I needed, I don't know if I'd ever felt a need for Jesus in my life. Amen. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful to say that I had a spiritual background. Uh, we moved from here when I was just, uh, I don't know, two or three months old. My parents carried me to Carroll County, to Vaden, Mississippi, and then to West, mm -hmm. where we lived until I was five years old. And then my, the government came out with some sort of program where they divided these large tracts of land up into 50-acre farms. And my father and my grandfather each managed to get one of those. I, I'm a farmer today, but mm. I farm 50 acres. I did not <laughs> so, know that. <laughs> <laughs> that's not much of a farmer. But uh, I have a friend that farms it for me, and okay. all I do is just say, you know, when's the check coming? Okay. Uh, he takes care of everything. But we moved there, and uh, there were, I have four 
siblings. Um, my mother died at 63 years of age. I preached her funeral at her request. Didn't think I could do it. Mm. But um, because she wanted it, and my father insisted I did it, and then not long after that, my father died. And of course, before he died, he said that I had to do his. So, oh, how hard. So I lost both of my parents and preached their funerals, as I did my two of my grandparents. But we moved to a place called Horseshoe in <laughs> Holmes County. It's between Greenwood and Yazoo City. And uh, uh, that, was, that was home. Went to school at Chula uh, from first grade to getting out of high school. Enjoyed being there, but uh, glad I'm not there now. I'm glad I'm doing something else now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, so that was your growing up. How did you transi transition from that into being called into the ministry? All right. If I may, can I do a little thing before we sure. go to the ministry? Okay. Sure. Um, because it, it connects. Okay. My grandfather lived um, in that next house down the road from us, gravel road, all of that. My grandfather, self, I was a little bitty man. He was about 5'4", five, 5'3", five, and had had a stroke when he was in his 40s. Limped most of his life of my remembering, most of it, almost all of it. Um, my mother and father, like so many, had had some trouble in their relationship, but it didn't last long. My father, what really happened is my father was drinking alcohol uh, and uh, it was taking a toll on the family and his relationship with my mother. Mm -hmm. And so they ended up splitting up and they stayed split up for about a year, as I recall it. My, I was nine years of age okay. uh, at that time. We came home from on the school bus. We had this country school bus and we came home on the school bus and I got off the bus and I looked up and my little old grandfather was limping coming up the road. And um, he got there about the time the school bus got to my house. And uh, I went in the house and he called me back and he, he said, uh, he told me, he said, your mother and daddy are having some problems. But then he said, I don't want you to worry about it because I will always be here for you. Mm. Uh, he was my grandfather, the most faithful, godly man that I have ever been closely associated with. I guess many people have similar experience, mm -hmm. but it was true in my life. He taught me a lot of stuff. Uh, most importantly, he taught me about Jesus, required that I go to Sunday school and church with him. It was like he was focused on me. and. Um, so we'd go to Sunday school and church together. And uh, then I had a couple of other siblings at the time uh, that were younger. So my grandfather would put them to bed a little early. And then he would have me read the Bible for him beside mm -hmm. a, an old kerosene lamp. And I would get, that, uh, get the Bible out and, and uh, he would tell me what he wanted me to read. And uh, so he allowed me to read it. He requested that I read it. He never said why, but the fact is that when I was nine, I could read better than my grandfather could. He had a, like a third grade education. He was born in 1880. Wow. And uh, he lived in poverty all of his life, but he was an honest and righteous and good man. And so one night when we were reading the scripture, uh, when I was, I was actually reading to him, he, um, he just asked me, said, uh, he called me Bubba, <laughs> Bubba a son. He said, uh, would you like to be a Christian? And looking back, um, I didn't really know what a Christian was, I don't think, except that I knew that my grandfather was one. Mm. And I wanted to be like my grandfather. So I said, yes, I want to be a Christian. And so he prayed over me. And the next Sunday, he took me to church and he told me that I needed to make a public profession of faith. I didn't know what that was. 
But I was saved. He took me down. Later I was baptized in a fish pond. And uh, so that was kind of the beginning of how God was going to deal with my life. <clears throat> I, went to, I went to school in uh, Chula and uh, did all the sports and all that kind of stuff. And there was a point of time in that when my grandfather said to me, you're going to be a preacher. Hmm. Well, in my little church at Horseshoe, back in that day, uh, being a preacher wasn't a real joyful thing. You know, they it seemed to me that mm -hmm. they would get them and keep them for a little while and they would love them and then they would say, well, it's time, it's time <laughs> to change. <laughs> so my grandfather, when I was a, a teenager, my grandfather said to me, you're going to be a preacher. I prayed about it and God's just told me you're going to be a preacher. And I said, God's not going to call me to preach. So we had this ongoing disjointing because I was so turned off by what I had seen and experienced with, with in my experience, mm -hmm. with ministerial situations. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that I ever ran into a minister that was evil or anything, nothing like that. But I just knew that it just wasn't the thing for me. I didn't want people having Bob's self for lunch on Sundays. Mm -hmm. It's a hard, it's a hard calling to be in the ministry. Yeah, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I've been I know. A, I've been a, <laughs> uh, you know, I tell people whenever, whenever I tell them this, I, I say, oh, you should have said, oh, you don't look that old. But I, I'm in, mm -hmm. I am concluding my 52nd year as a pastor. Oh, uh, you don't look that most, old. <laughs> That's exactly the way you're Thank supposed you. to Thank respond. You. Thank you. Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but uh, anyway, my grandfather won out, I guess. Um, when I left home, I, I, left, I went to junior college two years to Holmes. And I, I didn't go to class. I didn't do anything. They gave me enough Ds. Back in that day, a long time ago, they would do that. They gave me enough Ds to keep me eligible to play football. So I played football for a couple of years, and then one day I just looked, and I had these, well, I had been recruited to a university, meaning they came and talked to me and said, we want to give you a scholarship. But then they came back in a couple of weeks and said, we can't give you a scholarship. We can't even get you in school. You didn't go to, you didn't go to class enough to qualify to get to go to school. So it was kind of bad. And so... Um, I, I, I mean, I, I wasn't going to get to go anywhere uh, to play ball or do anything. And, they, and I, then I learned at that point they required, in real schools, they, they require you to go to class. <laughs> so I decided I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going anywhere in a hurry. So I decided that I was going to be in the Air Force because somebody was going to give me orders and I had to obey them. And I, and I came on my own. I thought I needed that. So I joined the Air Force. The day I left for the Air Force, my father was driving me uh, to town to catch a bus, to go to Jackson, to end up going to San Antonio and going through training. And four years later, I, I did that in reverse. My grandfather came limping up. We had an old Ford pickup that my dad was taking me to Chula in when, to catch the Greyhound. And uh, as he, uh, as we were getting ready to pull away, my grandfather limped up to the truck and put his arm around my neck and hugged my neck. And he looked at me and he said two things. He said, I'll probably be dead when you get back. That was mm. very encouraging. <laughs> uh, he wasn't, but he said, I guess I'll be dead when you get back. And he said, I just wanted to tell you so you wouldn't forget. God's going to call you to be a preacher. So the last day that I was at home with my grandfather before going to the military, he said I was going to be called to preach. So it took a while, but it happened. All right. Were you in the military or were you out? I was, um, I came home, Nancy, my late wife, Nancy, uh, and I met when we were 12 years of age and we got married when we were 22. Oh. And uh, so uh, she uh, was a great encouragement to my life. So I decided I was overseas in Central America working in an underground bunker 
uh, where we had uh, crypto and, and uh, security for the Panama Canal and air traffic control and all of those kind of things uh, underground. And so uh, I, we, Nancy and I re reconnected. And so I hadn't been home in two years, so I got, got me a little leave to come home. And I had about, I had about two weeks maybe and so I came home and I went straight. I went by my mom and dad's and <laughs> shook hands and hugged the neck. And then I went to, my, Nancy was teaching school in Pascagoula. So I took off to Pascagoula and uh, we had us a date or two. And I said, I want, I want to marry you. I want, I want to be married to you for the rest of my life. She said, that's a good idea, but not now. I said, yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, you know, I said, I work underground. That thing could cave in on me. I won't go ahead and get this done. So long story short, we were separated uh, by all that period of time. And then I came home and I talked her, finally talked her into getting married. And the deal was that I wasn't going, we weren't going, once she decided to marry me, we weren't going to tell her parents, but we were going to tell my mother. Uh, and then when I got home from overseas for good, then, which was going to be another year and a half, uh, um, a year and a half later, we were going to get really uh -huh, married. Uh -huh. Well, uh, we kind of agreed on that. And so uh, when I finally got her to say yes, I only had uh, four days left and I had to be back overseas. And so that was back in the day where you had a three three day waiting period to get your license. So technically <laughs> I was gonna have one day uh -huh. before I had to catch an airplane and head back to Central America. Um, which I, you know, which we ended up doing, but, <laughs> but um, we didn't have much of a celebration. So anyway, we went to my house to tell my mother and Nancy told my mother, and so my mother said, have you told Nancy's mother? And I said, no, and we're not going to until we get back from, before I get back from overseas. She said, oh yes you are, you're gonna do that today before you leave. So I went to speak to her mother, and her mother, when I told her that Nancy and I had gotten married, her mother started uh, like a, a death scream. <laughs> And she said, I dreamed something real bad was going to happen, and it has. <laughs> <laughs> that was my greeting into the family. Uh, now, I want to tell you that we overcame that. <laughs> I wish I could tell you we overcame it the next day or a year later. But in about 15 years or 20 years, <laughs> we kind of overcame that. I wasn't much of a catch, I have to say. I wasn't a... I wasn't a minister or anything at the time. Nancy and I were married, and we were, I had just gotten out of the service, and so we went to a worship service in Escatawba, Mississippi. Bet you can't spell it. I've never even heard of it. I can't spell it either. <laughs> but it was a church down on the Gulf Coast at Escatawba, and uh, we were sitting on the back row. Our pastor... God had spoken to me just before I got out of the Air Force. Uh, I remembered it was just before Christmas, the last Christmas I was overseas. And Nancy sent me a Bible with my name on it. Mm. And when I opened it up and looked at it, I started crying because I knew that God had been dealing with my life and that I was not open to it, that I had been in open rebellion against His wishes for me. And... Uh, but I still didn't make it anything public. And I got out of the service about three weeks or a month later and uh, came home. And uh, Nancy and I went to, the, to a revival service at Escataba. And while we were in the revival service, the pastor, the minister, our pastor, gave an invitation in which he asked that God would give him one person who would give his whole life in service to him. Mm. And it was as though I was the only one in the building. Uh, I didn't walk down. I never, I have never in my life stood before a congregation and did all of this stuff about, mm -hmm. you know, I need to be licensed because I'm mm -hmm. going to be a preacher. I just knew. And I was sitting there and I, 
I'm not sure what my facial expression was, but Nancy kind of pulled up against me and I looked down at her and I whispered to her, I think God has called me to preach. And she whispered back and said, I know he has. I've always known it. Oh. <laughs> and so she, w she held my hand and whispered and said, I will go with you for the rest of our lives if you go into the ministry and I will continue to teach so you can get an education. Mm. And so I started then, That's 1961 mm. uh, in March. And God has borne great fruit from that. Yes. We're, this is the end of our first episode. Okay. We're going to wrap this up today, but uh, I hope you will join us next week. And you can also go on YouTube and look for Smelling Coffee TV, and you can find these episodes there eventually. So um, thank you for being with us, and we're going to keep taping. And uh, thank you for joining us today at Smelling Coffee TV, where we always seek the aroma of the knowledge of Jesus Christ in every place. I hope you'll join us next time. And if you need information about our church, check out understhesteeple.com. And uh, you can also um, find encouragement and lots of areas of living and life and love and faith and food and family and all kinds of things at my blog, smellingcoffee.com. Thank you and God bless you. And we'll see you next time.